Hello. Today I want to talk about the Gestaltist approach to perception. The Gestaltist view of perception began with Max Wertheimer's simple experiments with stroboscopic images. Using a variety of stationary lines and other images, which were viewed successively, he was able to produce various illusions of motion. Even after his subjects had been told what was happening, they were unable to prevent themselves from seeing the movement. Wertheimer was able to rule out the possibility that the phenomenon was due to eye movements, as had been held by Wundt. He did this by creating complex images which would require a range of different patterns of eye movements, and concluded that the illusion was due to a psychological shortcut in the brain which existed outside the immediate perceptions involved. This was the phi phenomenon. Although the physiology involved in the simple phi phenomena is now known to be more complex than this, Wertheimer's basic idea that the illusion of motion takes place in the mind rather than in primary sensation is accepted. Wertheimer hypothesized that the phi phenomenon was merely an expression of a wider truth, that it was the mind which ordered incoming sensory data into an organized meaningful unity, a gestalt a German term for form, shape, or configuration. Subjects perceived an image as a whole, rather than isolated elements, which were then linked together by a process of association. Having spent months working to explain a trivial illusion, Wertheimer and his co-workers had sown the seed for a new school of psychology that would deepen and broaden psychology in both Germany and the United States. The establishment of this new school effectively began in a small way in 1912 when Wertheimer published his first paper on his developing ideas, dealing exclusively with the perception of movement. Then in 1913 he gave a series of lectures outlining his new psychology. The central doctrine was that our mental operations consist largely of gestalten rather than strings of associated sensations and impressions as believed by both Wundtians and associationists. A gestalt has a structure with an identity. It was different from the sum of its parts. It was not a mere accumulation of assorted bits. Despite the youthfulness of its proponents and the severe disruptions of World War I, during which both Wertheimer and Kafka were involved in war-related research, and Kohla was marooned in the Canary Islands, their ideas slowly spread within the network of German psychologists, taking off rapidly after the end of the war with a bevy of publications which examined the issues involved in more detail. Although Gestaltist thinking was by this time concerned with a wider range of issues, it was its insights into perception which initially received the most attention and research effort. Thus, by the early 1920s, the trio, their students, and several others influenced by their ideas had identified a number of principles of perception, the so-called laws of Gestalten, some of these discussed by Wertheimer himself in a rare paper in 1923. Eventually, 114 laws were named. Some of the most important laws of Gestalten included pregnance, proximity, similarity, continuation and closure. The principle of pregnance, which in this case means conciseness or pithiness, originates in the concept of being pregnant with something and refers to the underlying tendency of human beings to see the world in terms of the simplest possible shapes, ignoring more complex alternatives. Many of the more specific laws of Gestalten are specific expressions of this tendency. Thus, the principle of proximity occurs when we see a number of smaller objects which are also close to each other, and we tend to see them as groups or sets. Wertheimer gave the example of a set of dots or lines which are perceived as constituting a group if they're close together. The same is true of perceptions in everyday life. For example, when we see a number of unrelated people as a group simply because they're standing close together. But Wertheimer deliberately chose examples which are abstract and removed from the meaningfulness of everyday life. The principle of similarity operates in much the same way. We tend to group objects together with other objects which are similar to them. 
in a figure made up of circles and crosses, we will see them as two separate sets. Note that similarity commonly overrides proximity. Two dissimilar objects, which are close to each other, will be grouped according to their similarity with distant objects, rather than with objects that they are close to, but which are different from them. The principle of continuation refers to the tendency to see directionality in arrays of objects, and so assume a coherent continuation of an existing pattern. Thus, in this picture, we see a second key behind the first, and believe it to be whole. Finally, let me mention the law of closure, which occurs when we see what we think is a familiar or coherent pattern, even with some of the parts missing from our view, so that we fill in the missing bits of our minds and perceive the simplest and most satisfying gestalt. For example, we see an implied shape, as in the famous illusion of the Keniza Triangle, where we see a white triangle that does not actually exist, and behind it, through the law of continuation, we see a black-lined triangle. Another area of interest to the Gestaltists was figure ground perception. This is the general tendency that when we pay attention to an object, we see little or nothing of the background or landscape beyond it. For example, we focus our gaze on the person close to us that we are talking to and do not see the details of the view or of events behind him or her. This feature of human perception was nicely illustrated in 1915 by Edgar Rubin at the University of Göttingen, who devised one of the most famous of all optical illusions, the drawing of the Rubin vase, in which we either see the vase or the profile faces which outline it at a particular moment, and not both at the same time. In this, the mind is able to focus attention on a meaningful pattern and ignore the rest of the data. Note that we seem to be able to decide which of the two images to see by an act of will, a crucial emphasis of the importance of volition in the Gestaltist system, and quite different from the Wundtian and behaviourist perspectives. Another interest was size constancy. Thus, we know that when an object is far away, it projects a smaller image on the retina than when it is nearby, yet we sense its real size. How does this happen? Associationists used to say that we learn from experience that remote objects look small and pale, so that we associate those clues with distance, but Gestaltists thought that this associationist view was simplistic and contrary to evidence. For Gestaltists, we sense that distant objects are as large as when they are near because of associated clues from other objects around them, as with the individuals in this fresco by Pietro Perugino, for example. The image on the retina may be smaller, but our minds recognize it as larger. Like much of the Gestaltist perspective, these insights into the functioning of perception were revolutionary when they were first presented challenging as they did both the Wundtian paradigm, formerly dominant in Germany, and the behaviourist paradigm, then prevalent in the United States. But eventually they were accepted and became part of the mainstream account of psychology, typically forming a significant part of the chapter on perception in general introductory psychology textbooks.